What's your understanding of the take up in, in schools of 12 to 15 year olds and 16 and 17 year olds? That, there doesn't seem to be that much data coming forwards. What's that telling us? So there really doesn't. So we don't really have any data on that. And all I can glean, Richard, is probably what you have from the press. And it does seem that as you go down the ages, take up seems to be a little bit less than um, as we've seen in adults where it's actually been really high. So I think that's just a sign of uncertainty amongst parents and also in teenagers not really knowing what or why they're doing this. Right. And um, the, the, uh, the, there was sort of an issue about the consent forms uh, and whether or not uh, it was appropriate in schools. I think that was changed. Um, what, what, what are you hearing about? Uh, is it is it now um, accepted that uh, consent has to be given by the parent for 12 to 15 year olds? Is, is that really happening? So as far as I can tell, <clears throat> parents are being consent, sent consent forms at home where they can either decline or accept the vaccine on behalf of their child. And that is exactly as it should be. And I'm pleased that that's happening. And I would always expect that to happen because that's how we work in the NHS with any vaccine that we give um, to somebody who's under 18. However, there still is this unclear um, statement from both Nadahim Zahawi and I think Sajid Javid that if a child expresses a wish that they want to have a vaccine and their parent has declined, then there will be this skillet competence assessment within a school to decide that that can actually happen. And I think that's um, unwise. I think the moment as a society where we start dividing parents' decision making powers from their children, um, I think we've really just wandered into really uncharted territory that's dangerous because then what where else does it go what else can a child decide that they want to do you know drink alcohol drive a car not go to school anymore you know i think parents should have you know the right over their children to decide what's best for them yeah quite right i mean I, i'm with you completely on this it feels very much like the thin end of the wedge like so many other of the uh, measures like vaccine passports that this government has sort of uh, been on the edge of introducing. I just want to move on now to um, some of the other aspects of, of vaccinating people and, and treating people with uh, this, this horrible virus. Um, because, you know, as, as, as we know, any medication carries a, a tiny, tiny level of risk. Um, of you know, we all understand that. And, 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 you know, information and data is absolutely key here. And um, many people may not be aware, I'm actually quite surprised how few people are aware, that you know, when one does get an adverse reaction, then uh, there is a system in order to log that so that the medical authorities, the pharma companies, uh, the health service ca can learn uh, what's going on. Um, so we have this system, don't we, called the yellow card system in yes. the UK. Uh, to log about uh, reactions, for, for, indeed for, uh, for any... Um, uh, any, any vaccine. How well known uh, is this system amongst um, people in the medical world and, and, and indeed amongst the wider community? And, and is it being used by doctors if they become aware of reactions? Okay, so I mean, there's lots of different points there. I would like to think that all medical professionals are aware of the MHRA yellow card system because we're putting our name on prescriptions for drugs and medications and vaccines every day. And so it's important that we have a way of feeding back if we think there might be a problem. I think the important thing to know is it's not for a doctor to decide or a nurse or anyone else to decide that a vaccine has caused a problem. All the yellow card system is for, and it's really important, is to identify that there's a problem with a patient. Then what happens is if those are fed back all of the time, the MHRA, the overriding governing body, will actually see if there's a cluster of specific reactions, and then they can start investigating whether or not a drug or the vaccine or any other vaccine has caused it. So I don't think doctors or medical professionals should be worried that they are actually making a report to say that a medication or a vaccine has caused a problem. That's not what they're asking us for. They're asking us to just highlight any problems. And it's a very easy system. In relation to the COVID vaccine, there's actually an online portal and it really doesn't take very long. So I'm worried that people, A, think it will take a long time. And let's face it, doctors, whether in a hospital or a GP, are under intense time pressure. So the thought of doing something that's gonna take them half an hour, it's really quite daunting, I can tell you. Um, but then again, they also know, 
need to know that actually it's simple it's quick and they don't even have to be the ones that can do it the patient can do it as well and I had a patient who actually beat me to it on one of these right I mean I, th I think that's fascinating because um, in the US they have a, uh, a system of I think a very sophisticated system um, which is, is called VARS which I think stands for uh, vaccine adverse event re um, uh, reaction uh, system uh, wh where there's a lot of data collected uh, and that then is, is used extensively and gives real confidence and understanding and extra data uh, that the authorities and the pharma companies can learn from. Is our yellow card system, is there enough detail in it, uh, Rene? And, and you know, it just feels to me that in a sense, the more evidence and data you've got, then actually the more confidence all of us will have in any form of medication because you know there's that feedback going in in an honest and open and transparent way. Yes, and I think there's two things that worry me about this. The first is that I think many professionals, including myself, are missing potential vaccine side effects because either patients are not reporting it to us or we're not joining the dots. And I say that having sat talking to colleagues and we then between us go, oh, I wonder, and we hadn't thought about it at the time. I personally had a young patient who had pericarditis that I did not link to a vaccine. And only when he had it for the second time, did I then look back at the timeline and see that it was exactly the same time span after his second vaccine. Did I, make, did I join those dots? And actually he had already joined the dots for himself and um, had reported it for himself. So I worry that we're not actually making those connections. And I think therefore we should say to all medical professionals, look, however small you think it is, however unlikely you think it is, if there has been any kind of reaction, just report it. It doesn't take long and report it. I am reassured that although the yellow card reporting system itself is quick and easy and very simple, that when you actually report something serious, so I actually have a 21 year old patient who has myocarditis after a vaccine, and that was reported by the hospital that he attended, the, the parent actually got questions back from um, the M MHRA wanting much more detail. So I think they are picking up significant problems when they are reported and they are then asking for more detail and that's encouraging. That, that, I mean, that's what we want. That, that, that improves information, it improves knowledge, it improves data, uh, which I, as I say, I think does build confidence. We shouldn't be afraid of that. People shouldn't be worried about reporting. Uh, it's really well, important. Think... Just finally, um, yeah, just, just finally, I just wanted to uh, catch up on the latest, uh, your latest thoughts on where we are with, with boosters, Rene, because, uh, you know, obviously uh, some countries are, like Israel are going through a huge sort of third dose program. Uh, what's the latest in the UK now with boosters and, and take up? And, and is that really the right way or should we be actually using these doses to ensure that many more people around the world are getting their first dose? Look, Richard, I think without doubt for vulnerable people who were at risk from dying from COVID, and, and trust me, vulnerable people have been dying from COVID, I think making sure that their immunity is as good as it, as it can get is a good thing. The people I think who should be prioritised for boosters, and I know I'm not part of the JCVI, are those people who really didn't mount a very good or at all um, immune response to the first two vaccines. And I have someone in my family who falls into that category. They are a dialysis patient and after two AstraZeneca vaccines did not have any antibodies at all. So we fought to try and get him a different vaccine, a Pfizer, to see if it would help and couldn't get it. And yet now here we are, I see 50 year olds who have no vulnerabilities apart from being 50, who are being offered boosters and having them as we speak, and he is still waiting for his. And I think Blood Cancer UK and um, the Kidney Association have also said this yesterday, that we are not putting these people at the top of the booster list. And that's probably that's... the kind of people that we should we should be boostering. And then in we terms of- yeah, we should be focusing on. And then in terms of everybody else, we should and be thinking about the rest of the world. We should be thinking about people who okay. have had no vaccines. Brilliant. Rene, that's really helpful. 